the last video uh, we introduced stationary or standing waves and in this video we're going to look at them in a little bit more detail and we're going to look at uh, their application I suppose in real life and we're going to look at a maths equation as well okay so I want you to imagine we have a guitar string here and uh, somebody's playing the guitar and they pluck the guitar string here's their finger they pluck the guitar string right in the center well if they pluck it right in the center you'd assume that they're going to create maximum displacement in the center and we learned last lesson that the name for maximum displacement was antinode because obviously with a guitar string it's fixed at both ends so we're going to have a node or a point of no displacement at both ends now this is going to produce a sound and the sound that it produces will have a frequency and if this is the pattern or the standing wave pattern that occurs the frequency is known as the fundamental frequency so that guitar string will always produce that sound always produce that frequency if it's um, a certain type of string and the tension is a certain amount and so on the fundamental frequency is also known as the first harmonic and let's say it produces a sound of 20 hertz that's a, well, that's a very deep sound but let's say it just produces that um, then imagine that a person comes along and same guitar string but they don't pluck it at that end they pluck it at this end here well they're going to create a node here and if it's in the correct position it might work out that the wave travels along the wire reflects against itself and we get a standing wave with this pattern and this pattern we know from last lesson is known as the second harmonic now there's another name for this as well the second harmonic and those of you who do music might know more about this than me is also known as the first overtone and again this is going to sound different it's a different frequency than the first one but because it's the second harmonic its frequency will actually be double the fundamental frequency it will be 40 hertz and that's something we didn't look at last uh, lesson the actual frequencies it's going to be double let's say we have exactly the same situation again but the person plucks the guitar string in a different position they might get this standing wave or pattern produced and this one is known as the third harmonic and we could keep going and keep going third harmonic will be known as not the first overtone the second overtone and you might be able to figure out the pattern here what frequency do you think the third harmonic will have well it's going to be three times the fundamental frequency it will be 60 hertz and we could keep going here and we could do the fourth harmonic which is the third overtone and so on and so on but you need to know these drawings because they could ask you to draw and i think they did in the mock this year actually draw uh, the first three harmonics for uh, a stretch string um, one other thing linking this to music and some of you might know this with music as well is when you produce a sound if you produce a sound that has all of these sounds occurring at the same time so you have the first harmonic second harmonic third harmonic all playing at the same time it improves the quality of the sound and the more overtones you have playing kind of together the better the quality of the, the sound and that's something that they'd ask you as well they'd ask you how can the quality of sound be produced so this is something you want to take down in notes the quality of a sound depends on the number of overtones present so the more overtones that are present the better the quality of the sound and again that's another topic and in the waves test we talked about how sound is affected by changes in frequency and how it's changed by affected in amplitude well quality um, is affected by the number of overtones so looking at this we've kind of assumed certain things are constant so let's just go back and look at the first example here and I might draw it at the side here when we look at this we kind of assume we have a guitar string or we, we have a guitar string and we pluck it and it makes a sound but if you got exactly if you got another guitar and you got the top string and the guitar the E string or whatever and you pluck that would it give you exactly the same sound well it mightn't because there are other variables that we have to take into account here and the other variables would be one the type of string 
you can buy different strings for guitars. And what's different about them is they're different materials, but one thing that you could say is different about them is actually their mass per unit length. You could have denser strings or less dense strings. Mass per unit length. And obviously if you have a more dense string, it's obviously going to produce a different sound. Now mass per unit length has the symbol mu, and it's like a U with a tail, but we say it is mu. And if something had, let's say, a mass per unit length of 0 0.005 mass kilograms per unit length, m to the power minus 1, it means every 1 meter of its length weighs 0 0.05 kilograms mass per unit length. Per unit length means for 1 meter. Anything else could be different that might produce a different sound between two different guitars. Well, you know, on the top of the guitar, you have those little kind of twisty things for changing how tight or how loose the string is. So what that's kind of changing is it's changing the tension in the string. And when you're tuning in the guitars, that's the first thing you do. You change the tension in the string to try and get the sound right. So that could affect it as well. We call that T. So all these different things can affect the, the fundamental frequency. And there's three in total that you need to worry about. First of all, the frequency or the sound that a string produces is inversely proportional to its length. And we demonstrated that just a minute ago when we talked about where you pluck the guitar string on. But actually, what this is probably more dealing with is if you have a short guitar string or a long guitar string, they're obviously going to produce different sounds. It's also affected by the tension, but it's directly proportional to the square root of the tension. And you don't need to worry about where the square root is coming from here at the moment, but um, we will talk about this when we do the experiment in a little bit more detail. So that's tension. And tension is a force, how much the strings are being pulled apart or how much the string has been pulled apart at either end. So that's a unit is length and meters is obviously the, or that's the unit of that is Newton, sorry, and meters is obviously the unit of length. And the last thing it's proportional to is one over the square root of mu the mass per unit length. So all of these things can affect the sound that's produced by a guitar string. And remember the sound or the pitch of the sound, I should say, depends on its frequency. We can put all this together in an equation and the equation is F equals one over two L root T over mu. And remember that's the same as one over two L root T over root mu, just when in terms of rearranging. And this is our equation for finding the fundamental frequency on a stretch string. And the stretch string bit is important because we have different equations for different kind of situations. So it's on a stretch string like a guitar string or anything like that. And we do an experiment in school on this. And when we do the experiment, we use a box and you'll see it in your notes, but basically it's just a box uh, called a sonometer and on that box on the top we have a piece of string but at one end we have this thing just like on a guitar that you can change the tension and we can put different strings on it and we can you know we can uh, actually we put a little bridge here in the center and we can move that bridge up and down to kind of train change the length of the string we're looking at so if I have the bridge here I'm looking at the length from here to here but if I move the bridge to this point I'm looking between here and here. So we can kind of investigate it using a sonometer. So in today's lesson, I want you to understand this equation or learn this equation. Uh, hopefully you have a bit of understanding of where it comes from. And I'm just gonna do one example very, very quickly because I want to make sure the videos aren't too long or else they don't uh, upload onto YouTube. The first one is just a standard, put the numbers into the equation. It's on page 199 of your textbook, so I'm going to ask you to look at that one yourselves because that's that should be okay. But I'm going to do the second example. <coughs> Here we have a 3 centimeter cube of iron. So 3 centimeter cube, let's say it looks something like that. It's iron. Its density is 8,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And it's stretched into a uniform cylindrical wire of length 2 meters. So basically what happens is they get this wire and they, they melt it down or they stretch it and they turn it into a wire which has a length of two meters. 
Calculate the mass per unit length of the wire. Right, well, first of all, if we want mass per unit length, mass per unit length is how much one meter of something, or the mass of one meter of something. So what we want to do first of all is we want to find out, well, what's the mass of this full object? Well, the mass of this full object is obviously going to be the same as the mass of the cube because it's made from the cube. So what do we know about the cube? Well, we know its density and we know because it's a cube, it's going to be three centimeters tall by three centimeters wide by three centimeters long. So from that, we can calculate its volume. So if we know volume and we know density, density is mass per unit volume, we can figure out what the mass is. So first of all, uh, density we know, right? Well, if we rearrange this equation, so density equals mass over volume. That means mass equals volume times density. Now density we have, so we just need to find the volume. So how do you find the volume of a cube? Well, volume is length times width times height. It's three centimeters here. Remember, it has to be meters, so 0 0.03 times 0 0.03 times 0 0.03, or we could have just cubed it. And that gives us an answer of 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5. Our mass then is going to be the density, which is 8,000 times the volume, which we've now calculated is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 5. Into your calculator and you get 0 0.216 kg. So that's how much 2 meters of this wire weighs. And I shouldn't use the word weighs, but that's the mass of 2 meters of this wire. So the mass per unit length by definition is how much does 1 meter of, a wire, uh, of the wire weigh or have a mass. So we have to divide this by two, and we get our answer 0 0.108 kilograms per meter. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, but again, you can re-watch the video, you can pause it to take notes, and don't be afraid to ask me questions on Teams.